Welcome to episode 31 of the Going For Broke Outdoors podcast, a podcast by an outdoorsman for other outdoorsmen. I'm your host, Jeremy Gillespie. On today's podcast, I catch up with Ethan Eskew. Ethan is a relatively young guy at 25 years old, but in a few short years, he's crafted quite the resume, regularly targeting and killing specific bucks in his home state of West Virginia. Ethan and I discuss his evolution into a hunter targeting specific bucks, glassing tactics for areas with minimal to no agriculture, trail camera strategy, postseason scouting, and the importance of hunting a specific buck instead of good areas when pursuing a target animal. If you're a first-time listener or return listener who still hasn't subscribed on YouTube, click the subscribe button to let me know you're finding value in these podcasts. Also, if you're listening on an audio-only platform like Spotify or Apple Podcasts, I would generally appreciate if you could leave a review of the show. Before we jump into today's episode, I want to give a shout out to Uncle Lou at Stealth Outdoors for helping to make this podcast possible. Check out Stealth Outdoors at www.stealthoutdoors.com. Get a jump start on your gear preparation for the 2023 season with the products from Stealth Outdoors. Designed from the ground up with the mobile hunter in mind, Stealth Outdoors manufactures climbing stick wraps, cam buckle covers, platform cable wraps, and stealth strip rolls for all of your miscellaneous silencing needs. Stealth your mobile hunting setup this off-season by visiting www.stealthoutdoors.com to silence your gear and to place an order today. Now, on to the podcast. All right, on today's podcast episode, I got Ethan Eskew. Ethan, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. How are you? Pretty good. Ethan, for people who aren't already familiar with you, give us a brief bio and how you became involved in the outdoors. Uh, yeah, so my name's Ethan. I live in West Virginia, uh, east side of the country. Lived here essentially my entire life. Got involved in the outdoors in general at a very, very young age. Um, was introduced to hunting by my grandfather at a fairly young age, but he was a very uh, light hunter, I guess you could say. You know, one or two days a year during gun season, um, and nobody else in my family really hunts with any severity so my passion or obsession depending on who you ask has kind of bred solely out of my own interest really over the years and then what are you doing for work and what what do you like to do when you're not hunting if i'm not at work or hunting i'm usually sleeping or thinking about hunting (laughs) (laughs) i uh, i'm a mechanical engineer uh, by career i've been doing that for a few years now but yeah, I mean, I fish, uh, really into archery. I used to compete seriously. I shot for my college when I was in college. Uh, I was on the university archery team, traveled around the country shooting competitive archery, became an All-American. Um, so that was awesome. So I used to do a lot of that. Ever since I got out of college, I stepped back or kind of away from the competitive scene. And like I said, basically only hunt and think about hunting now. So. <laughs> Yeah, wouldn't have it any other way, though. No, that's awesome about the competitive shooting. We might have to touch on that. I've been following you on Instagram for quite a while, and I didn't know that. I do know from the videos you post, you post a lot of cold bore or or open one-shot shots, and you seem to be a very good archer, so that would explain a lot of that. So if we get a minute later on, we'll have to touch on that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And another thing, it seems to me, and this might be biased observation on my part, a lot of guys that have a high level of success in hunting have some sort of engineering or machining you know that kind of work background so that's interesting to me also i know like dan infault for example comes to mind he's a a prototype machinist and then there's this other guy in the hunting beast that i know he's an electrical engineer so must be something about that analytical thinking that lends itself well to killing big bucks yeah i know a few guys that have similar brains i guess you could say that uh you know i think i may know the guy you're talking about also but uh yeah that is kind of a weird trend that i've never really thought of until you just said that yeah so i don't know exactly how old you are but i know you're a relatively young guy you know compared to a lot of average age hunters i would say but you've already knocked down a bunch of nice animals so i'd like to know when did you kill your first big buck and what lessons did you learn from that experience Yeah, I'm 25, so I'm pretty young in the grand scheme of things. I mean, I've been out of college for three and a half years. So I would say, you know, I killed my first big deer. So again, I live in West Virginia. You know, we'll probably touch on this here in a little bit, like the size of deer in this area and whatnot. 
But I think to make it more accurate, when I say big deer, I'm talking in relative terms. So, you know, I killed one of my first really, really big deer for this area three or four years ago. I'd have to think about the year. And, you know, I had killed some really good deer before that, but I was in college and I didn't, you know, I didn't have as much time. Um, I was really, like I said, I was doing the, the competitive archery and I was getting an engineering degree and I still hunted a ton and I still killed good deer. Um, I was usually a one buck a year. Uh, I think I had one, uh, one or two college years that I shot two bucks and they were good deer. Like I would say really solid deer for this area, but not like 99th percentile deer. My first year out of college was the year that I killed my first really, really big deer. And that deer kind of taught me a lesson, a, a valuable lesson that you got to find the deer before you try to take on the task of killing a deer in that percentile. That was like a really big turning point for me. You know, you say, what, what did I learn from that experience? And that was the number one, the number one learning point was if you want to kill a deer that is next next level in a particular area you have to find that deer and pursue him you can't just hunt good spots because you might kill a good deer in a good spot but you have to kill exceptional deer where exceptional deer live and that was a big turning point for me yeah so that's a great point and i'm just uh, I'm, I'm older than you quite a bit older than you i'll be 40 this year and i've killed a lot of solid deer too but I'm just getting to the point on my personal journey where I'm starting to target those bigger deer. And that's a great point. If you want to shoot 150, 160, whatever the number is in your area, like you said, that's a great point too. A lot of this stuff's relative, right? If you're in Florida, a great deer is going to be maybe 110 or 120 versus if you're in Iowa, big, big difference there. And I think everybody that's, uh, yeah. that's outside the Midwest, especially people acknowledge and realize that is a fact, but yeah, you've got to find those deer first, and they're not everywhere. So that kind of segues nicely into another question that I had for you, which would be what tools, resources, or experience do you believe contributed to you getting that deer? How do you go about locating those deer now when you're on the search for something that's uh, top end in your area? It's multiple strategies. Like I said, um, I have kind of developed an eye for where – you have a better chance of finding a big deer. And that's just through, you know, I say that I do nothing but scout and hunt and think about hunting. And that's, that's legitimate. I mean, I've spent an insane amount of time on it and through so many experiences. And now in the last three or four years, many, many repetitive experiences, finding those next level deer in different areas, you kind of start putting the pieces together of attributes that they have most of them it's either going to be it's either going to be a really big tract where there's not a lot of guys hunting say you have a square mile of just regular rural wood standard stuff square mile and three quarters this is an extreme example but three quarters of the square mile is one private piece that say two guys have permission on you might not be able to get on that three quarters of it, but you might be able to get on 20 acres right next to it. It may not even be a set sanctuary, but it may be somewhere that has a much, much higher chance of letting a deer grow old, or it may be butting up against a place that is a sanctuary that legally no hunting is allowed or a large property that's privately owned that the private landowner just doesn't allow hunting for anybody. And those are things you just have to, you know, you really have to kind of dig, dig into it and, you know, basically every really big deer I've ever killed is, was either on a big property or surrounded by a big property or next to a place that you couldn't hunt. There's always something in the neighborhood. I find that very rarely do you find exceptional deer in normal, quote, normal areas, you know, like say a 500 acre piece of public surrounded by 40 acre chunks that everybody hunts. For me, I, I wouldn't even look at that stuff anymore personally because the chance of me finding a deer at the caliber that I want to chase in that area is so low that 
I just focus my efforts anymore on places that have a higher ratio of success on finding those deer. You know what I mean? If that makes sense. Yeah, that's something I talk about quite a bit. So I've got a numbers statistics type background. And so I'm very much a, an odds numbers type guy in anything that I can find trend wise, whether that's habitat or like you're talking about the property itself, pressure, whatever it is, deer behavior, anything that I can leverage where that's going to up my odds. Then that's something I'm always taking note of. So I think what I heard you say is property itself is super important. And if there's any way you can kind of suss out the details of the relative pressure in the area, you're honing in on these lower pressure areas. Trying to. Yeah. I mean, I've killed a surprising amount of deer on high pressure areas, but they may be next to a low pressure area. If that makes sense. You know, like I've killed quite a few really, really good deer on areas that, you know, it's, it's actually public. I'm thinking of one area that I've killed a few really good deer on it's public. You know, I personally know of, a handful of other guys that hunt it, and it is not a big parcel. But you can outsmart those guys, play it, play the cards differently, I guess is what I'm saying. Those other guys, as long as the deer is there, you know, like I'm not scared to hunt a piece that a bunch of other people hunt if I know the deer is there. And without trying to sound arrogant, it's because I believe that most of the time, I can play those cards differently and get a crack at that deer. You know what I mean? But that deer is typically only there because there's something that's not on that property that's keeping him in the area, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It does. So the property itself obviously is an important consideration. Now we're talking about bigger deer here. Have you noticed anything about like common terrain features or vegetation or let's say topography, something where you keep finding, not always, but there's, a again, higher odds that you're going to find one of these better caliber deer as far as those variables go? The only thing that I can say that I have consistently found is um, available security cover. I've never found a next-level deer living in wide open hardwoods. I don't even look there anymore. They may feed there in the night on acorns or something, but... If I'm, I'm typically always hunting in or extremely close to very, very thick cover, which the area that I live, the woods in general tend to be pretty thick. So that doesn't really narrow it down that much, honestly, in, in my immediate area. I've hunted other places though, around the country where you can definitely key in on thick areas where the majority of the woods are wide open. I find that locating, this is on traveling hunts and I find that that locating good to great deer is a way easier actually when the majority of the woods or landscape is open and there's pockets of very thick cover because the deer just don't have that many options. You know what I mean? So it makes locating, I'll, I go straight to the thickest stuff every time. Yeah, that's what I found. So I'm from Michigan. Originally I live in Montana now and the landscape, just the Western landscape in general, I know you've done some Western hunting as well. But in the plain states, you know, Nebraska, Kansas, the Dakotas, Montana, the available security cover is, is severely diminished, and it does seem like locating those deer is much easier in, in that type of environment. Yeah, I would say so, for sure, especially whitetail. I feel like from what I've seen out there is mule deer, they can really carve out weird little places out in the wide open. Yes. Um, <laughs> but mule deer or, or whitetail, it's like, you know, <laughs> you've got plains and plains and rolling grass hills, and there might be a couple sprinkled out there. Um, but it's like, you know, go to the river bottoms, get around the, co the cottonwoods. And I haven't done any Western whitetail hunting, so I can't speak too much. I don't want to speak out of my place. You know what I mean? That's just what I've noticed while hunting other species. Sure. Well, we talked about some of the success you've had already, but let's rewind a little bit. Let's go back to when you were first getting – it's more serious about hunting at whatever age that was. And let's say you've killed a deer or two or one or two bucks, maybe looking back now with the experience they have, give me two or three of the biggest that mistakes that you made early on. So I'm going to break that into two different development periods. So the first is like you said, you know, I've killed a deer or two and it's extremely early on the personal journey. 
we really don't know much at all. You know, the amount of mistakes made in that period is astronomical. I mean, you're just learning to hunt. I made <laughs> hundreds of mistakes probably every time I walked in the woods from not understanding thermals to not playing the wind at all, not even knowing what a thermal is, not knowing deer behavior at different times of year, not understanding bedding, not understanding food. I mean, just not understanding basically anything, you know, when you're really, really fresh. And at that point, it's like you just got to try to keep going out as much as you can, learn personal experience, and then absorb as much information as possible. I mean, I was a article, video, and podcast addict, especially podcasts, which is ironic because, you know, I enjoy doing podcasts now. I was the first person I had ever known personally in my life that had listened. I was the first person I ever knew to listen to podcasts and I consumed everyone I could ever find about hunting, which were few and far between early on. So I just had made endless mistakes. The second period is that period which you start killing some deer, you start killing some decent deer, but it's not consistent. You know, you might get luckily every once in a while, but you're doing some things right, but you're not doing everything right. And you put in so much time that, you know, eventually, you know, blind squirrel will find a nut every once in a while. That's kind of a period that I was in for quite a few years there. Like I killed a lot of decent bucks, killed some good bucks, but I never killed anything great. And the, during that time period, I was just consuming, consuming, consuming. And, you know, I, I honestly think that one of the biggest mistakes that I made that I don't hear people talk about much is I listened too strictly. So I would listen to a lot of guys on podcasts and videos talk about the deer that they're killing, how they killed them in the areas that they hunt. And I made to be all kinds of areas over the country. But I think what I did was I listened to strictly. So, you know, a lot of guys talk about, this is one example that I feel very strongly about. A lot of guys will talk about, you have one chance to kill that buck. You know, you hunt him, you go in one time, and if you don't get him, you know, he's spooked. You keep that, that spot is ruined. I mean, you hear this a lot, right? Yep. I completely disagree with that if it's the right situation i have killed multiple really good deer old mature deer in spots that i've hunted multiple times a season the buck that i the first buck i killed this past season uh, i don't know if you remember that big red antlered 10 point yep i shot him the fourth day of season and i hunted that exact tree three out of those four days in a row and killed him on the fourth day. I just kept, and I would have probably hunted it another three days in a row if I hadn't killed him that day. And I can kind of go into that mentality of hunting the same spot more under the right conditions if you want to. But I, back to the original point is that for years I listened too strictly. I would find a good deer. I would hunt him one time and I would in my head say, well, you know, this one guy says, and he's killed way more big deer than I have that I, you can't go back. Right. So, and again, under other circumstances, I agree with that, but you have to become super adaptable. You have to become a person who can read every situation. And my situation is different from yours. And that's different from that guy's. And that's different from another guy on a different podcast. And, you know, they're all different. See, I think the biggest mistake I ever made in that transitional period of killing good deer was I didn't pick the right tidbits of information during consumption you know but now looking back it's like everything that i know not everything but the majority of what i know now was learned through information consumption but now my style is a, is a culmination of little tidbits here and there from tons and tons of people over tons and tons of landscapes tons and tons of experiences information i've absorbed but i've taken tidbits and i've molded those into my own style and my own mentality and my own strategies and apply them in the areas that I actually hunt. And that once I started doing that and I kind of used the information that I had with an open mind, I mean, it was just night and day. I mean, I just started killing at an extremely, 
extremely higher rate of success. Yeah, I want to unpack a few things that you said there. First of all, and I couldn't agree more, it seems like no one's journey is the same. And the too strict part, I can relate to that too, because, well, a lot of things you said I can relate to, but too strict, yeah, you think, okay, this guy said it. Like you said, this guy's an expert. This is the only way to do it. And it's the only way to do it because he's 20 or 30 or 40 years older than me and look at a wall full of bucks and that's what he does now. So that's the only way. That might be one of the more efficient ways, but that's also not the only way. And it is also obviously tailored to that particular person's home turf. Generally, there's a lot of guys now that are that are very efficient traveling hunters doing it across multiple states. But each person's style is informed by exactly what you said, what you've consumed as far as you know information, what you've studied, how you read maps, your own personal experiences. So that's a great tip, especially uh, seems very informed for, for someone your age. And I'm not calling you uh, a young whippersnapper now that I'm an old man. <laughs> but it's taken me a long time to learn that as well. And I went through the same periods of evolution. And that's that's one of the things I like doing about this podcast or one of the reasons I like to do the podcast is because I've consumed a lot of podcasts myself and it seems like when you listen to 10, 20, 30, 40 different guys, you start to see the common trends and those are the things that I really try to home in on. Like, okay, what's applicable everywhere? And again, a lot of that stuff's going to be informed by your own experiences, but something else I want to talk about and again, couldn't agree more, multiple sits. I think Sometimes, and, and I'm sure you've had these experiences where you sit in an area and you get winded or something happens and you know the spot's burned. I'm assuming you don't go back to that area the next day or, or that week. You're giving it some time off, correct? Right, exactly. Yeah, so talk to me, and, and I've, I wrote down some notes here, and I probably got a list, and I guess maybe flesh these out or tell me if you agree or disagree, but multiple sits to me. First thing that's important to me is access. I need a good access to that stand location that doesn't go, obviously, across bedding areas, doesn't go across regularly used trails. None of your scent's going to blow into any of those areas. Obviously, you got to have a consistent wind for that access or, or maybe even alternate access that works on different winds. So maybe talk about those. And then also, you did say you, maybe you would have sat there three more days. How do you know in a spot that you're going to sit multiple times? When you know it's burned, when you move on? I would say, you know, it's burned once deer activity. I have always been able to see a difference. And honestly, this is a spot that I wouldn't have seen a difference. This is a spot where the access is dynamite. This is a spot that the deer, I killed this deer at the very edge of a feeding area. Um, he's a mature buck. Most deer don't come out until fairly late there you know they have to work from bedding to feeding this was early season this is an area that i've observed all summer long i had every deer in the area patterned i mean it was i spent so much time on on this area and, and, and this deer the thermal switch in this area pretty early due to a shadow cast from a steep ridge so this is an area that you can hunt on almost any wind as long as you get that thermal cast which you do every evening so I had a dynamite entrance and exit. I had almost any wind availability as long as it's not a super high velocity. And I had these deer extremely patterned. Um, and I actually got ruined. One of those three hunts, I got ruined by two other hunters that were in the area that walked right through my shooting lanes and up into the bedding area. I believe spooked that deer, but I still went back, which I usually wouldn't do, but they spooked him out. And immediately afterwards, a giant torrential downpour came. And they were working uphill towards this bedding area. So this deer did not smell them on their approach. He busted out due to sound. Before he was available to come back to smell and assess what had happened. Tor I mean, when I say torrential, I mean like torrential downpour came through. So to me, that's a reset button. He heard something. He ran. That's a very, very, very light bump on an early season buck. Most people wouldn't go back. I did go back and I killed the deer. So that's a very specific example. But again, that's being able to see what is in front of you with an open mind and put all these pieces together. You know what I mean? Like you just said, if, if the deer gets bumped, you don't go back. 95% of the time, that's correct. But 
if you put all those little pieces together, like I just said, you can take chances that you normally wouldn't take. You know, if I just said, if I just threw my hands up in the air, it was like, dang, other hunters blew him out. This deer's gone forever. I'm just going to go hunt other bucks. You can easily talk yourself into kind of giving up. And I've done that a lot. But in that case, you know, it was more of a, well, put these pieces together. Maybe that happened. Maybe he's still there. I think there's a good chance he's still there. And there's probably a good chance he's still going to come out and feed here in the next couple of days. And he did. But if a buck smells you, you're toast. You know, if he's coming in, he's 50 yards, wind switches, he smells you, don't hunt there again. Um, that's a clear and obvious example. But I've hunted set two, three, four days in a row, and you can see deer activity in general diminish. Those are typically areas that the entrance and exit is not that great, and deer will bust you. And that, that's typically during the rut. Like if I hunt one spot for two or three days in the rut, I'm trying to be there when that deer passes by. You know, he's not typically there 24-7 in a super, super small little core area like they are most other times of the year. So there's so many variables that go into that. But basically, if I see deer activity diminish or if I know that I have bumped that deer and he smelled me or it was any type of hard bump, then immediately I'm out of that to answer the question. Yeah, and I'd, I'd agree with you there, too. Also, I think uh, if I had to put them in order, I would take a sound bump over a visual, and I would take a visual over a smell, smell obviously being the worst. And I normally, almost always, without fail after that, abandon ship for, for greener pastures because it's usually over then, at least for a while, when you get smelled out like that. Yeah, I would agree. Well, something I want to unpack a little bit, you talked about almost any wind because of thermals. And I know, obviously, from what I've seen on Instagram and, and you hunting in West Virginia, probably a lot of hill country setups. So let's talk about, and without giving anything too specific away about, you know, the, your area or whatever, the buck, what did your setup look like? And how did the falling thermals impact your setup or your setup on the downwind? Maybe talk about your access and how that played out and and how you're taking advantage of that, I'm assuming, evening falling thermal. Yeah, on that deer specifically or more of in a general sense? Uh, either or, but if you want to talk about that one specifically, that, that'd that be good. Yeah, I'll touch on that one. You know, that one, I hunted him three days, uh, the one day I couldn't hunt, and I killed him the fourth day of season. I believe the winds were different all three days, and they were low velocity. So I was hunting down, like elevation-wise, lower than him. So I didn't want a very high velocity wind to kick my scent up the hill to him. Um, I went in in the evening, you know, at that time, thermals aren't really going up, but they're not really pulling down quite yet. They're just kind of moving and pulling at my general elevation. But then, like I said, this area specifically, and this is literally why I chose to hunt this specific tree is it gets a very hard shadow cast early in the evening and it just immediately makes a large thermal switch right in that specific area. If I was 20 yards in front of me, this thermal switch wouldn't happen as drastically as early. So it's very specific as to why I hunted that exact tree. But basically what happens is these deer, they pull out of areas around me, mostly uphill some from below, but what really makes that exact tree amazing is there's a very narrow but deep ditch right at the base of the tree. And what I've found is that I've dropped so many pods of milkweed out of that tree that that scent, once that thermal switch happens, goes right into that ditch and it will carry down that ditch. I mean, it is literally like water. It's the best thermal drop I've ever seen. I've had deer stand two feet from that ditch and not smell me. I shot this deer at three yards. He came right to the base of my tree unexpectedly and his chin was two feet from the ditch and he did not smell me. And, and I shot him, he ran off, dropped, I dropped milkweed and my scent was going right down that ditch. I mean, it was, it, it is the best thermal drop spot I've ever found, but that's why I chose that exact tree for that deer. But you know, yeah, living in West Virginia, I'm either hunting hills or I'm hunting mountains and thermals are a huge, huge deal. I've used them to my advantage 
many, many times, um, and especially hunting out west, you know, especially when you're in the bigger mountainous country, you know, thermals are the name of the game for no matter what you're hunting out there. So, and here too, but it's just a more pronounced effect, effect out west. Yeah, it's really opened my eyes. So Michigan, pretty flat land for the most part. And looking back, I'm sure there's some areas or some water features and things that I didn't understand as well at the time that were giving me thermal poles that I could have more intelligently planned for that probably got me busted that I, that I either wasn't aware of or didn't plan for, but kind of goes back to what you said earlier about playing the cards differently, right? You now have the level of understanding, which is a few tiers above the guy that's just playing the wind about one, just a knowledge of thermals too. And then like you said, looking for areas of heavy shadow cast, that's a, an additional advantage to get an earlier dropping thermal. And I think it's some guys, myself included, earlier on, you see these guys that are such consistent killers like yourself, you're saying, what are they doing different? And it's not until you really dig in the weeds and do some study, you start learning about topics like this and how important it is because, like you said, wrong tree in that area, you probably get busted. That deer is going to smell you if it's not blowing down that ditch. And it takes experience and study. I think the combination of both to start homing in on these better areas, better setups to get more consistent. So that was a great story and great illustration of maybe some higher level concepts that people, you can plan for that stuff, but it takes experience and it takes study to get to the point where you're at, where you can, you can identify that in the woods and actually implement it. Yeah, like at face value, the day that I killed him, I believe was I believe was a southwest wind, and he came out where I was planning. He came out at literally exactly where I was planning, but before I could get a shot, he turned and walked right to the base of my tree. But the entire time, he was dead northeast of me. So if you're looking at your weather map or your um, your weather app, looking at the wind direction, you're thinking impossible. I could never hunt here. Well, southwest wind is your most common wind, at least it is in my area, by far. So you have to, like you said, dig in a little deeper and, and find ways to cheat the system, if you will. And that's exactly what I was able to do on that deer. That's an interesting story. And that, that was an early season buck. And I know just from what I've seen of you on social media, you're a bit of an early season specialist and enthusiast these days. And I'm since moving to Montana, I'm also a huge fan of early season and September hunting now. So I'd like you to talk about maybe some of your favorite types of setups in September, what you're looking for and why you believe that time of year can be so effective for targeting big bucks. But before we hear from Ethan, I want to take a minute to mention huntingbeastgear.com. Co-founded by the big buck serial killer himself, Dan Infault, Hunting Beast Gear features state-of-the-art manufacturing techniques, the highest quality materials, and innovative designs that have been engineered, field-tested, and refined to perfection by a group of the best mobile hunters on the planet. www.huntingbeastgear.com delivers cutting-edge products, including Beast Gear climbing sticks with weight reduction holes designed to deliver incredible durability in a lightweight stick. Beast Gear climbing sticks also feature non-staggered inline stacking and double steps, all in a 2.2-pound package, including the fastening strap. Huntingbeastgear.com has also released the game-changing Beast Gear hang-on tree stand, Designed to be the ultimate hang-on tree stand solution with four years of prototyping, testing, and refinement, the Beast Gear stand features a 16-inch wide by 29-inch long platform. The stand comes in at an incredible 6.8 pounds, and it does all that without compromising strength or durability. The Beast Gear stand is finished with a long-lasting anodized coating and features grade 8 hardware, high-quality Delrin washers, beast buttons, and adjustment knobs. For more details and a place your order today, head on over to www.huntingbeastgear.com. And now back to the podcast. Yeah, if you gave me one time a year to kill a big buck, and uh, that was the only time of year I could hunt the rest of my life for whitetails, it would be September. Even though I do like hunting mule deer and elk in September too, but it's the best time, in my opinion. I mean, everybody loves the rut. Even guys like me that say they would take early season or late season over it, you know, we still love the rut. I mean, don't get me wrong. Everybody loves it, but it's sure. unpredictable. And like I said, if you're out there to kill a good deer, any good deer, you just want to kill a good deer, hunt during the rut, by far, no questions asked. But if you're trying to kill the 99th percentile buck in your area, well, you're going to have to chase an individual buck. 
And if you're chasing an individual buck, the best time to kill him, in my opinion, is ext- as early in the season as you can or at the very end of the season, depending on what state you're in, how late it goes, weather conditions. Late late season can also be phenomenal. I have only killed one deer in the very late season simply because, you know, mostly other years I'm out of tags. So It's a good problem to have. Yeah, 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 exactly. So early season – has be, kind of become my favorite thing in the last few years. I've arrowed a mature buck. This, you know, I wish I would have shot this buck opening day. I wish the other guys wouldn't have messed me up because this, if I had shot him opening day, granted it was only four days into season, this would have been the fourth year in a row that I've arrowed a buck opening day. That's a pretty impressive stat. Yeah, so it would have been, but it's only three years in a row because – fourth day but i'm just, i'm gonna we'll say in the first four days of season four years in a row i've shot my target buck which has really opened my eyes i just don't see anybody having that level of consistency during the rut opening day in the rut was november 7th i just don't see ever being able to confidently say november 7th you're going to kill that deer you might be able to go and kill that deer between the 7th and the 14th but not like early season. I mean, early season, if you have enough time to really, really study a deer, I mean, it, 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 it's their most vulnerable state, in my opinion. I mean, that's what I like to do. I like to find my target in the summer, put as much effort into patterning him as possible, develop a plan. I mean, it's like during season, you have about three to six or seven days at a time to make plans. You know, like, Early September is different from mid-September is different from September is a little more gradual change in my opinion, but especially into October, the first seven days, very different from the second seven days to the third to the fourth and all the way through until you get to about December. I think every seven days, the pattern changes in my opinion, to some degree. Yeah, I'd agree. But from June 1st to mid, mid late ish, sometimes September, they're doing the same thing. So you're not constricted to seven days to find a deer, pattern him, and kill him. You've got literally three months to develop a plan. So it's like, to me, it's not even close. You have three months to find a deer, develop a plan, and then implement it. And that's what I've been able to do the last four years. You know, once I get my, once I get the opportunity to actually legally hunt them, I typically get, get the crack, you know, and it's, it's not, it's not even something that I, and trying to, you know, brag about it. it's just I've spent three months learning this deer. It's like I should get an opportunity. You know what I mean? It's not like oh thank thank you like I'm so lucky. It's you know you should if you spend that much time patterning an individual deer, you should be able to get a shot. And that's exactly why I like the early season so much. I'd like to ask a few follow up questions there. And I guess the first one's not a question; it's a statement, but. I had Dwayne Diefenbach on my podcast. It was podcast episode number five, I believe, if anybody wants to check that out. But Dwayne is a research biologist for Penn State University, and he's the author of Penn State University's or co-author of their deer blog. And they do a lot of GPS collar studies. And one of the really big takeaways I had from looking at those studies is the home range size in September is very small. So if you can locate that deer, sometimes it's difficult because they're not visible or they're not very, moving very far. But if you can locate that deer, you're in the house already. I mean, the, the core home range size, that area, uh, in, in those areas that time of year from the GPS data can be as small as like 90 acres, but the average is something like 500, which in the grand scheme of things, finding a deer, if you got it narrowed down to 500 acres, you're doing pretty good. What that also means to me is that you've got to be a lot more precise. And that's my first question for you is how do you balance scouting and without spooking that deer, given that it is in a small area and you got to be careful with how you're intruding. Are you doing glassing? Are you doing observation sits, camera, cell cam, some combination? What do you do to keep tabs on that deer to formulate a plan and not spook them before the season opens? All of the above. Glassing is my favorite because you get to actually observe the deer. You don't just get a picture that tells you how big he is and what time he was there. Something that I've kind of preached is I don't really hear other people talk about, but I know other people know about it is deer personalities. 
Some people laugh at me when I say that. I would strongly disagree with their laughter. Every deer has a different personality. Some deer are more spooky than others. Some deer are naturally more social than others. Some deer are naturally more aggressive than others. Just think about people. You know, you've got extroverts, introverts. You've got people that are scared of their shadow. You've got people that go out that want to fight every night. You know, it's just personalities. And deer, in my opinion, are the same. And you can, you can't learn that from a camera. Maybe if you have it on video mode, you get a lot of video about other deer. But if you glass him, I'm talking a lot of times throughout the summer, you can learn the deer's personality. And then you can actually use the deer's personality to tailor the way in which you hunt. So I've hunted deer that, I've hunted old mature deer that walk around with this confidence, like nothing's going to kill me. You know, they they think that, you know, it's like they've run this pattern for four, five, six, seven years, and they're pretty confident in it. You can just see it in the way that they move over the landscape, the mannerisms in which they, you know, move and traverse and interact and, you know, other, and then you might have a buck right next to him, the same exact age that every two seconds is flipping his head up and he's stomping and he's just scared of everything, you know? I like the ones that walk around confident because trust me, I will find a chink in their arm. <laughs> that's the other ones that have given me a little more trouble. But like, for example, if you have a deer that's just has that kind of confidence to him, I have found that you can be a little more aggressive at times, but it's those deer that are super, super, super timid that are really challenging to hunt. And, you know, I've, I think that you have to try to do setups where you aren't going to run into as many deer around you for those bucks because if a button buck sees or smells you and blows, he's gone. Whereas sometimes those old boys that a button buck runs away, he might look up and be like, eh, it's just a young deer. You know, I'm confident in what I've got going on here, what I can see, what I can smell. I'm confident in my routine. I guess that's just my own opinion about deer personalities, but I've seen it enough times glassing so many deer so many times over and over and over that I've definitely been able to tell a difference. Another thing is social deer versus non-social deer. Um, you can differentiate that. Aggression, you can differentiate that. Uh, aggression and dominant, you know, I've, and they don't always correlate. I've seen deer that are the dominant deer but they will not fight, you know, unless they absolutely have to. But they will kick anyone's butt. That's the dominant deer. But then you have aggressive deer. You may have a four-year-old that's not the dominant deer, but he's just out there wanting to kick everyone's butt. And I, I will use that to my advantage because later in the year, if I don't get a crack at him early and I have an encounter during the rut, the deer that's passive, that never wants to fight, that's never aggressive, I'm not going to call to that deer. I'm going to try to naturally kill that deer. But if I see the other deer, that four-year-old that's always trying to fight everybody, I'm rattling and snort wheezing and going to bring him in. And I killed a deer doing that five or six years ago, and he I shot him almost straight down at the base of my tree. So that's just like little tidbits that I think are not commonly talked about because people don't glass and observe these bucks to the extent that I do commonly. I mean, I'm, don't get me wrong. I'm sure there's lots of guys that do it, but th talking about that compared to trail cameras, I mean, how many people run trail cameras versus how many people do what I'm talking about here? You know what I mean? Sure. These days, it definitely seems like running a camera is the default over spending hours buying the glass. Right. And don't get me wrong. I love trail cameras. I use them extensively. I think they're an incredible tool. And to be you know, there are many, many areas that I can't glass anything. And, I, you know, I live in West Virginia. I'm not glassing bean fields. We have no ag here. I'm glassing power lines, gas line right ways, hay fields, you know, apple orchards, sure. like random stuff. You know, I'm not glassing ag fields ever here. I mean, I've glassed many big deer in other states in ag fields, uh, put together plans that way, but when I'm talking the bucks that I really are intimate with, the ones that are around here, I'm not glassing big open stuff. So you got to get kind of creative with finding them that way. But 
if you can watch a power line five days in a row and you can see zero to 1,200 yards on a power line across multiple hills, and you do that for five days in a row in the summer, you're going to know if there's a big buck in that area crossing that power line. I, I can't tell you how many deer I've found that way. You just got to get creative with it. But in general, the majority of the woods here, the majority of the landscape is unglassable. The trail cameras are a huge, huge tool in my tool bag in finding that 99 percentile buck. I use them extensively. That's a good prelude to getting into a discussion about trail cameras. So what does your trail camera strategy look like? Let's talk about, first of all, conventional versus cell cameras. And then I'd also like to know, are you leaving your cameras to soak? So let's say our, I call it prospecting. Are you putting a camera out in an area for this whole season and hoping to use that data next year? Are you doing real or near, near real-time intel during the season? What's your combination? What's your strategy look like there? I do all of the above, and I use all of the above. I just started using uh, cell cams in 2021. They are a phenomenal tool, in my opinion, if you use them correctly. Let me stop you right there. Differentiate, because I hear guys say this a lot, and I I never pick on them, but I'm going to pick on you. Give me, and it can be hypothetical, but give me an example of a poorly implemented or poorly used cell cam and then a properly used. What would you say? What are the mistakes guys are making, in your opinion, or how do you use them that you think is preventing mistakes? If you have a budget and you're not completely made of money, I'm assuming that you have a limited number of cell cameras, which that applies to me, and I would assume it applies to almost everyone. Agreed. You can use a conventional camera that is much cheaper, that you probably have more of, in a real-time scenario, if you use them correctly. And I can get in touch on that in a second. So what I like to do with cell cameras is I like to use them in areas that are that I want real-time info on a specific buck. Again, this is, I don't hunt good spot. I may hunt a good spot, but the core range of A or multiple bucks have to overlap in that spot. That's how I killed my second buck this year i had a cell camera in an area i monitored um three different shooters that would use this area knew when it was heating up was able to get in there hunted it two times different trees but same general area killed killed that deer let me stop you one more time when you say heating up what's that look like on the cell camera that this means they're daylighting they're in the area more frequently would you move in if you were getting nighttime pictures what's what's heating up look like to you both I really like to see daytime pictures, obviously, but if that deer, if that deer passes by one time at 11 PM, that doesn't have me very interested. That deer comes by at 8.50 PM and then back through at 1230 at night and then an hour before daylight. And then you never get any daylight pictures and you see that type of movement for like a, a day or two. I'm getting in there. He's never that far away. And you got to realize that a, I think a lot of guys overlook this. A trail camera looks at a 20 by 30 or 50 or whatever foot rectangle in the woods. That's it. So you have to be very realistic about what that camera is actually covering and what that camera is actually showing you. If that buck walks past that little rectangle three times, even if it's at night, in one night, he is never that far. If it's during the rut, why is he not that far? Well, probably a hot doe in the area or the doe that's soon to be hot in the area. Or I've seen bucks shift core areas quite a bit. They'll go into one area, check it out for a while, and then they'll move on to another area, check it out for a while. I don't really know exactly why they do that. I've seen different bucks do it in different ways, but it's a pattern that I've taken advantage of numerous times, killed numerous good bucks in the rut during with that. But yeah, if I see that, even if it's all nighttime, I'm moving in. Now, if I see him there at midnight, 8 a.m., 2 p.m., and then 7 p.m., you know, he's all over the place in there. Then I'm screeching tires trying to get there. But that is heating up to me. This has happened to me quite a bit. You may get a picture of a buck once every five days. And then there's going to be one stretch of 
year. And I don't know about you, but I, I used to always notice this on those year long soaker cameras that you're mentioning. There might be one shooter buck that you consistently get on that camera and he's very sparse all year, but there's almost always a two or three or four or five day window of days in a row that like he's there. And it might be from September 1 to January 30th. There's five days that he was there. And if you were there, you would have killed him. That is what cell cams give me is I don't have to check at January 30th and say, crap, I should have been here November 3rd through the 8th or October 20th to the 25th. You can see it real time with a cell camera. You can say, okay, it's here every five days, four days, six days. Now he's there six times in the course of two days, whether it's day or night, he's there. Go in. You know what I mean? Yep. So I I know there's some controversy on cell cameras. I've gotten into it before. But for me, it's legal, and it's an incredible tool for me. I do still utilize utilize regular cameras also, though. And you can get that same real-time information from regular cameras. Not Obviously not to the degree that you can with a cell camera. But there's been many times that I've checked a trail camera every day for 10 days in a row. Now, this is always during the rut because, again, I'm trying to identify when that deer is there. Whether it's a hot doe or they're just in the area for a couple days, you can check a camera every day for 10 days and not scare deer the same way that you can hunt a tree and not spook deer. Got to be good entrance and exit. You got to be able to not leave much scent there and i usually check in at night during the rut because i'm hunting during the day so i like to do i will utilize spots like really really close to a road that way it's like super low impact like i'll just pull off i'll leave my truck running lights still on run into the woods i mean i've put cameras i've literally put cameras five yards off paved roads before and gotten intel on box up to you know maybe maybe 100 yards or so but close to the roads. These are typically on like smaller little pieces that you're kind of working weird angles. You know, obviously you can't do that if it's a mile back in the public. You can put a cell camera there, but you can't do this. But there's no reason to waste the cell camera, again, on limited funds, on a spot that's 75 yards off the road with a great access trail right to it that doesn't cross any deer trails. When you can just put a regular camera there and check it every freaking day during the rut. Right. And I've done that multiple times i run myself ragged during november between working hunting checking trainers at night prepping food for all day sits i mean it yeah so that's kind of how i use trail cameras early season i'm all about if i can't glass i'm about establishing patterns and that is a lot harder with cameras than glassing in my opinion because you have to constantly be moving the cameras and the more you're moving the cameras, trying to find where they're at, the more you're leaving scent, the more you're in there disturbing them. It's doable, but glassing, you're, you know, a million miles away to a whitetail and you're never disturbing them until you kill them. So I prefer glassing early season. Honestly, where cameras absolutely shine for me is during the rut, because like I said, when I say rut, I'm, I'm talking October 20th to November 30th, generally in that time frame. A buck is just going to have a, I've seen it so many times. He's just, for whatever reason, going to have a couple day window that he is in there. And I've killed, well, I killed my, my biggest deer ever to date, uh, the last buck I shot doing that exact strategy this year. So that's actually a really good, a good example of some things I can touch on, but I've killed three of my last four rut bucks were, well, really, really all four of them were hunting areas when they heated up, judging off of cell cameras during the rut. I mean, it's it's an extremely deadly tactic. I had uh, Jake Hofer on from Exodus Podcast, and we talked about seasonal timing and, and the rut specifically, and he mentioned the same thing. A lot of times that's an annual pattern that repeats on specific bucks. So these bucks that you hunted, targeted, and killed – you're talking about the cell cam information. Was that specific to that year or did you learn something in a prior year that led you to think, Hey, that deer is going to be in this area. Most likely if he's still alive, put the cell camera in there and then get back in there. If he's still alive, how'd that work out for you? Both. So out of my four last four rut bucks, which were, I killed two rut bucks this past season 
and two rut bucks the year before that in 21. Three of the four were, I had no historical data. It was all real time stuff. You know, I found the deer that year, put the cameras up, monitored good areas. And when I say, when I say good areas, you know, that's when you're talking your classic, you know, pinch points, down in the bedding area, you know, rough front, like, you know, everyone knows the classic rut stuff. Sure. So I'll put cameras in areas like that within the home range of that buck. And it's like, I wait until he's using that exact area and then I move in. And it's, I mean, it's just proven extremely deadly. I've killed three of the four on my first sit in during the rut. And then one of them on the second sit, um, which they were a week apart. That was one of the two that I killed this year. Kind of speaks to the effectiveness of the tactic. If three out of four times, the first time in, you got it done. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my whole goal is efficiency in general, which like this year was insane. My efficiency, which I can touch on that in, <laughs> in a second if you want to. But I want to finish this thought about this uh, tactic. I've done it real time where you just learn the buck this year, you put the camera in, you watch, and then boom, he's there. He's It's warming up, it's heating up, get in there, there he is, you kill him. The biggest deer that I've ever killed, uh, the one, I, the last buck I killed, I picked up a piece of property last year. I ran cameras in it all year. There was never a buck in there that I wanted to kill last year. Uh, there was one really good deer, but he wasn't what I wanted to kill. He was a three-year-old. He was a good deer. I thought maybe this year that he would be a shooter, depending on how much they put on, you know. And he was just a clean 10-point, but he had really short times. So I thought maybe. So I hang some cameras there this summer. And what I noticed about this deer last year was this was one of those areas that I had a camera soak all year. This deer was in, like, sparsely there. But then again, last year, there was a period in November that he was there all the time. So I thought to myself, okay, now going into 2022, if this deer survived, I will probably have a good play at him somewhere in this general vicinity of time. And my plan was to put a camera in there, figure out if he's a shooter, if he is a shooter, put a cell camera in there and wait for that heat up. Well, I checked my camera in August and I think I broke my jaw off of a log when I checked the, <laughs> the pictures. What I was looking at was the biggest deer I've ever had on trail camera in West Virginia. And I was confident the biggest deer that I will, would have ever seen. I had never seen him in person at this point. Would be the biggest deer I've ever seen in the state of West Virginia. And I was just like, okay, I'm just, I'm not going to get itchy. I'm just going to run, run the playbook. You know, like I just said, put a cell camera on that pinch and I got one picture of him in August. I did not get another picture of him until I think it was like mid October. Actually, no, I was in South Dakota mule deer hunting. It was like October 24th or 5th. So I went almost three months, two and a half months without getting a single picture. And I just kept thinking he's going to be back sometime in the rut. And then I started getting a couple more pictures of him at night, but it wasn't, wasn't there yet. You know what I mean? Yep. And then I went in, I killed my big eight that I killed in the rut this year. And that day he started showing, he showed up daylight, the 12 point showed up daylight. I had to go recover my eight point the next day. So that day was out for hunting. The 12 point came through after dark the next day. And I'm like, okay. He's in there. Tomorrow's go time. So it was a Monday. I took off work. I went in there, did an all day sit and killed him at 26 yards. The first time I ever went and hunted that deer. First time I ever laid eyes on him. He was locked on a doe. I watched him. This was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. It's the biggest deer I've ever seen in my home state. I watched him breed a doe three times. I watched him bristle, snort wheeze and charge four different bucks protecting his doe. This way, I had him under 60 yards for over two hours. And I mean, when I say it was the most incredible hunt I've ever had, <laughs> I mean, it was unbelievable. And he finally, finally gave him the opportunity 26 yards, put a perfect arrow in. But that's just 
you know, and that's back to back hunts. Like I killed my two rut bucks on back to back hunts, you know, Saturday and then Monday, uh, taking Sunday off in between to recover the eight point. So the strategy works. I mean, it's uh, in the last few years I've started to employ it. It's just, it just, it works if you know how and where to employ it. Yeah. And that's something I was going to say is it sounds simple, but obviously there's a lot of glassing. There's running the cameras, there's identifying these locations, all that stuff, uh, or a lot of that stuff revolves around having a built up level of experience and spending a lot of time in the woods. And that's the stuff that's like hard to shortcut. So it kind of sounds easy, but it's because you put in all the work to get to that point. Yeah, especially this past year, you know, back to like the efficiency thing. My goal has always been to be as efficient as possible because as much as I like just hunting you know i'm out there with a purpose and it's like i can still hunt just as much but if i kill more animals it's like that's even better so like this year i fit in two western trips in my fall also and still was able to kill three whitetails and i hunted let me think so i hunted four uh four days early season killed a buck i i hunted eight days for a buck total this year and shot three that's pretty impressive again i'm not trying to like toot my horn i'm just there are certain things that i've come to learn that's like don't waste your time unless you're confident that's another thing that's a big thing that i've learned if you're not confident don't hunt go scout go shoot your bow so you know you're going to hit something when you do get your opportunity don't hunt unless you're confident like anymore i will not it in a tree or in a blind or on the ground or whatever i will not hunt unless i can confidently say i'm going to shoot this thing today like i just won't it's getting to the point now where i can usually with somewhat accuracy you know call the shot and uh that's just due to so much scouting and and build up to that moment and that day you know i just don't hunt unless i'm confident anymore yeah, and that's just to reiterate, you said you spent eight days hunting, but I, you know, and I don't want to take a guess, you can tell me if you want, but how many days <laughs> did you spend glassing, scouting, running cameras, observing, like, and I think a lot of times it's easy on social media, especially to see guys like yourself or, you know, name any other consistent, successful hunter, thinking, oh, these guys, they're getting it done all the time, so easy, but it's like, yeah, but they're putting in a ton of behind the scenes work because that's how you do it. There is no secret. Like that's how you do it. Yeah, you're right. I probably don't want to total up my days or hours. <laughs> you probably wouldn't, probably wouldn't look too good. Anything that gets results, there's work involved. And that's the work that right. a lot of people just don't see. So, yeah, it's so much, you know, and it's, it's crazy to look at this past year I had where I've killed three big mature target bucks. In, in eight hunts versus, you know, back when I, in that transitional period, you know, I talked about earlier and that one late season buck I, I talked about, I shot a buck in January on my 70th hunt of the year. Wow. So like that year was a grind, 70 hunts, 70 days in the field after whitetails and never killed one until January on day 70. So it's just a reminder that like, you know, back then it was all about grit and just persevering until you get a shot. And now it's so much more calculated and so much more specific and and surgical, you know, it's just a great, great comparison that year versus the year I just had. Sure. It's hard to, and this is the point I bring up to friends or people that are listening it's hard to get to that efficient surgical point though, without doing some of that long grinds, because when you're not doing things efficiently or effectively or making the best use of your resources, a lot of times it's just because you don't have the experience. And the only way you get the experience is by having those kind of seasons. Yeah. I mean, I learned so much that year, the year, the, the 70 foot year I'm talking about, because I think the buck that I killed was the 15th shooter that I had in range that year. And I was at full draw, I think, like 13 of those times and didn't kill one. So you want to talk about the frustration, but also the learning that occurred that year. You know, that was probably, and that was 
actually the last year, the next year is when I killed my first really big deer. And it's just been on that level since. So I think that that year was kind of pivotal for me hunting 70 times and being full draw 13 different times, you know, without releasing an arrow on big deer. It's just, you learn so much doing that. So, so much doing that, that, uh, I think that was really a pivotal season, you know, taught me a lot. And that's that firsthand experience, you know, like, like we've been saying, you can read and listen to all you want, but unless you're out there grinding, doing it yourself and developing your own playbook, you're just never going to learn the way that you would. Great point. And it's just a fact of life or fact of being a, a bow hunter that it just takes time to evolve and goes along with all the things that we've been talking about as far as building your own style, learning those lessons, getting more efficient, but We've, so we've talked about hunting quite a bit. I want to jump ahead. So it's January 5th today, and you're obviously the guy that strikes me as a, a 24-7, 365 type hunter. So in your opinion, speaking of being effective and efficient, what's the most effective use of a guy's time in January and February, in your opinion? What are you doing right now to set the table for the fall of 23? So I'm not done with this season yet oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i uh i've still got some hunting left in me i'm leaving in i think like two weeks or two and a half weeks and uh, i'm gonna be hunting whitetails down south so i've got one more whitetail trip in me and then i'm i'll probably try to shoot another doe here locally so Jan- january and then you know i, I duck hunt and waterfowl hunt quite a bit as well I uh, just got back from some pheasant hunting in Iowa and, you know, hunt a lot. So February is really where it kind of shuts down for me. So for me, the best use of January is keep killing. <laughs> <laughs> but February is where it kind of shuts down for me. What I like to do is just just like most people would say is I like to postseason scout February, March, postseason scout, shed hunt. But I do it targeted. So. I do not just go out and look for new areas anymore. I just, there's no reason for me to do that because there's a very low likelihood odds, like you said earlier, that a buck that I want to kill is going to be there. What I will do is if I locate a deer one year via glassing or camera or sighting, and I can get permission on that property if I don't already have it, then I will go in. And I will try to find that deer's lair. That So even in the spring, I am scouting in March for the deer that I'm going to kill in November. I'm not scouting for a good area that a good buck's going to walk through. You can do that, and that works. I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of guys that prove that that works. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, like, I don't want to kill a good buck here anymore. I, I want to kill the biggest available, and you just have to hunt specific deer. So you have to hunt specific deer, and you got to scout specific deer when you want to do that, in my opinion. So, yeah, I'm going into places that I know that deer was in, and sometimes they don't survive. You know, sometimes they get hit by a car, they never show back up, they get poached. I've had it all happen, and it might seem like wasted time, but... Maybe another one moves into that area because I, I have had a few key areas that I have pulled multiple next levels out of. And that is really nice when they show up where you've already taken one and that you've already learned because it's like, I got you. Like, I've already learned this. Um, I might have to tweak it just a little bit if the deer's got a different personality or utilizes the landscape a different way. But the best use of postseason, in my opinion, is figure out the deer that you didn't just kill in the past season for you it sounds like uh, and maybe i'm wrong more often than not that's one that you had tabs on that you were either waiting another year to get after it or didn't run into it or maybe tagged out before you got it or how often is this a new deer well in postseason it's almost always what it has to be a deer that i knew of uh whether like you said you know in the example of my 12 point this year I knew that I knew he wasn't a shooter last year but I knew that there was a good chance that he was going to grow into the deer that I wanted to kill I just didn't realize that he was going to absolutely blow up an insane amount into the biggest deer I've ever seen but I was in there in February and March scouting I mean I walked 
all of it. And I picked the exact spot. I mean, I literally was like, I'm going to shoot this deer right here, like where I'm standing. And I ended up arrowing him 10 yards to my left. And I was standing in that spot in March. And it was the exact deer during almost the exact same time frame, 10 yards. I mean, it, you can figure this stuff out six months in advance with a little free context from the season before. Or like you said, maybe you tag out and there's another deer and you're like, okay, he's my, he's my guy for next year. Or they're not big enough in the case of that buck. Or you just never catch up to them. Like you said, it's, you know, they more often than not, they do win. But that's when you get back in there in March, you just look at it from different angles. You know, there was a buck that I never did catch up to. And he was an absolute monarch. I had one encounter with him when he was either four or five. And I chased that deer for like three or four years. I was kind of obsessed. And every February, March, I would be in there scouting, looking at it from different angles. I picked, I, I found one of the sheds in all those years. And I don't know what ever happened to him. He, I never heard of anyone killing him. Um, he just vanished in the thin air eventually. And uh, he still kind of haunts me. But every year, you know, I was in there looking at the same stuff in February, March, multiple times, trying to figure out how do I kill him, where do I kill him, what time of year. And that one, he beat me. He, you know, I never, never had an opportunity. But that's typically what I'm doing in the off season is scouting for specific deer. That's interesting. And like you said, if you're going to target those upper tier, older age class bucks or specific bucks, you've got to be, I think uh, this is my opinion ways. You've got to be as intimately aware of their home area where you expect to find them in that terrain as they are, which means spending a lot of time in the woods. And again, that's one of those things. I think it's easy to gloss over right on social media, seeing people that have, uh, consistent success but i do know especially now i have after having multiple big buck killers on the podcast that that's a consistent theme even if it's not in present day because you know some guys get busy with kids and stuff but at some point these guys have built the foundation of knowledge and that foundation of knowledge was built on spending a lot of time in the woods yeah for sure i mean i don't spend nearly the amount of time in the whitetail woods that i used to um, just a few short years ago because I feel like I've put so much time into it that I've just gotten to the point where I can look at things with a more keen eye. And again, I'm so, I used to scout 30 new spots every spring and then, you know, you don't even end up hunting all of them and you don't, you're not exactly sure what's around. You might find some good rubs, but like, you don't know if that rub was made November 1st and someone killed him November 2nd for me but that over that that crazy amount of time is what gave you the the base the foundation for being able to be more meticulous and more surgical like I don't I don't spend as much time in the whitetail woods as I used to I mean I still spend a lot compared to I guess the general public but compared to me when I was you know five to seven years ago not even close. Now, as you know, I spend a lot of my time either out west hunting or prepping for out west hunting. Um, that, and I'm not that good at that yet. You know, I'm still relatively new at that, and that is kind of what's taking up that that hunger and that grind in my life now. Because uh, you know, I'll never have whitetails figured out. You know, I respect whitetails an insane amount, but. I have them way more figured out than I do mule deer and elk and bear and pronghorn. So yeah, a whole new set of challenges there for sure. Yeah. So that's what consumes my hunger and my drive that like that hunger to absorb and learn and just grind and get that information and knowledge. You know, what I used to do with whitetails, I'm doing that now with all these new species and uh, it's a really fun process kind of having one that, you know, you, you understand pretty well you know and then you've got all these new ones that it's like man i suck at this again so, <laughs> like, yeah yeah like, that's what keeps you coming yeah. back though right exactly well we're gonna have to have you back on uh another time because i wanted to get into the western hunting as far as like what you're doing for logistics and preparations and stuff but 
we're running up on time here, so I don't want to jump into those topics today. But one thing I do want to do before we wrap it up is I want to turn it over to you. Any closing thoughts? And I guess specifically what I'd like to hear is looking back now, again, you're a young guy, so we're not looking back that far, but you have had a, a disproportionate amount of success. If you could narrow it down to one, two, three things, and we've obviously we've talked about a bunch of things here, or even things to avoid, mistakes you've made. If you're uh, talking to yourself at 16, 17 years old, where are you spending the, the majority of your time to get the, you know, those outsized gains and, and progress and skill to have the results that you've had? What are you telling yourself now? Identify your goals. If you're at a point where you just want to kill a deer, a deer, spend as much time in the woods as you can and kill deer, uh, learn how to be a killer. If you want to kill good deer, absorb as much information as you can still stay out there as as much as you can grind and learn, apply information in different ways. You have to ebb and flow to develop your own style. If you get to the point where you've killed good deer on a semi-consistent basis and you want to start killing great deer, in my opinion, you have to learn to hunt specific deer. You have to hunt specific deer, scout specific deer. You have to get much more surgical with it using some of the tactics that, you know, we've kind of talked about in this podcast, that would be my biggest advice is just identify your goals and then figure out what you have to do to identify to, to achieve that goal. Cause if your goal is to kill great deer, you can't do what you would do to just go out there and kill a doe. You know what I mean? So the biggest advice I can give to anyone in hunting or in life really is to identify your goal and be honest with yourself about what your goal really is and then put in the work to figure out how to make that goal happen. Yeah, and that's one of the things personally that I like about hunting so much. It's such a individual pursuit. You can, uh, and at times I imagine you did like I did, all of those goals can be super exciting, right? Kill your first deer, kill your first deer with archery equipment, kill your first solid buck, target a specific buck. And so hunting has a lot to offer no matter where you're at on the journey. That's something that I really enjoy about it. So I think that's going to wrap it up today. Like I said, we're we're running a little long here, but a lot of great tips, especially for guys that are looking to target specific deer. Uh, Ethan, I want to thank you for your time and want to say welcome back anytime. We'll have to schedule another episode to talk about Western hunting. So thanks again. Yeah, absolutely. I'm down to get on here anytime. Thank you, Jeremy, for having me on. It was fun talk about some awesome topics that I love to talk about. So thank you again. All right, man. We'll catch you next time. Thanks. Yep. Bye.